Hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk about a new approach uh, on the Linux Dev random implementation. Before I'd like to start, allow me please to say that I would very much like to be on site together with you to have face-to-face -face discussions and uh, talks about uh, this implementation. Unfortunately, the US government is not allowing European citizens to travel to the US these days. So therefore, it is just a virtual event, at least for me. Nonetheless, while you're watching this video, I am available at the conferences uh, chat system to answer all questions and all issues and comments that you have. Even after the conclusion of this conference, I would be more than happy to discuss uh, any issues and discussion uh, and, and uh, problems that you have over email or other communication venues. That said, let's have a look at the actual uh, presentation now. Before I'd like to, uh, to uh, jump right into the presentation, allow me to say that this presentation and also the code that I'm going to show here is a means to facilitate the uh, discussion around Dev Random and to achieve a implementation that is flexible to the extent needed by all different vendors and users. That said, my first step uh, to outline the Linux RNG implementation that I'm providing here is uh, to discuss the goals, the design goals with you. The second step is uh, to analyze and outline the design. Finally, I would like to cover the entropy sources with you and uh, followed by the actual initial seeding strategies that are applied to achieve a fully seeded DRNG as soon as possible. Okay, let's have a look at the LNG goals. Now, one of the first goals that I definitely have is uh, that only cryptographic primitives are being used for data processing. That means, in the LRNG, you will not find things like LFSRs or other uh, data processing uh, steps that do not rest on cryptography. In addition, I do have a logless high performance interrupt handler. Of course, when I say high performance, we have to compare it uh, to the existing Dev Random implementation, and uh, a later slide will do so, so to give you an idea of what high performance truly means here. Also, considering that the LRNG will uh, be the resting foundation of the cryptography in the entire Linux system, we need to have test frameworks for all uh, processing steps so that every researcher and every developer can have a look and verify that indeed the LRNG provides and performs its operation as it is supposed to be without losing entropy. An additional aspect is that during power up, but also at runtime, certain tests are applied to the received data and also to the implementation itself to make sure we always have untainted entropy data. A key element is that the LRNG uh, attempts to be API and ABI compatible to the existing that random implementation. This is clearly obvious but with the patch set that is provided. It provides a kernel configuration option that allows the LRNG support to be enabled or disabled. If you disable it, the existing that random implementation will be compiled. Otherwise, of course, the LRNG. And that also means if you apply the patch, uh, the LNG patch, there is no change at all needed in the remainder of the kernel or even in user space. So you can just use it as it is. Another aspect that is of importance is that uh, the LNG provides a flexible configuration uh, environment to support a wide range of use cases. Maybe a step uh, or word about my background. I'm working with a lot of different vendors, in-system integrators, and even distributions. And lately, I see more and more the problem that they have 
different use cases they would like to achieve, which is very difficult uh, with the existing dev random code base. And the LRNG should be able to cover all these use cases that at least I'm aware of during uh, my discussions with all of these different vendors. Another aspect is that the cryptographic uh, primitives that I mentioned at the beginning can be uh, changed and even changed at runtime if uh, it is allowed via the kernel configuration. Also, uh, one goal is to uh, provide a uh, an implementation based on a clean architecture. A clean architecture means every entropy source, for example, has its own uh, definition. It has its own implementation. The DRNG management has its own implementation. And all of those uh, different code bases are then being tied together. Yet these different uh, code parts work relatively autonomous and independent of each other. Finally, there is a standards compliance that I'd like to achieve uh, with uh, dimension standards, yet any code uh, uh, providing these standards compliance is only compiled if uh, a sort of respective kernel configuration option is being enabled. Otherwise, there is no code whatsoever being left in the LNG around this. The design is now uh, provided with the picture that you see here uh, in that slide. Let's focus on the center part, that nice little box with the different colors that is marked as the temporary seat buffer. This temporary seat buffer obtains the data from four different entropy sources that you see with, the, uh, with these different uh, colors here. And it will concatenate this data before it's being used to see the DRNG. By concatenating the data, you see that all entropy sources are being treated equally, which means also that there is no possibility that any entropy source can dominate any other entropy source. It is easily possible that such a thing could happen if you consider the CPU-based noise source, for example, like RDC. RDC is uh, an instruction that provides data relatively fast compared to the other entropy sources. Yet, the LRNG ensures that the CPU noise source will not provide unlimited amount of data uh, to the DRNG and therefore monopolizing the uh, temporary seed buffer or the uh, other entropy sources. This is achieved by the fact that the seeding operation of the DRNG is triggered by the boot process of the LRNG or by the DRNG itself. So it is not possible that a entropy source can say, hey, I have entropy available and I would like to feed it straight into the DRNG without regards of the other entropy sources. Also, the LRNG uh, provides the means that the entropy sources can be selectively disabled at compile time. So this already is one aspect that should allow vendors and system integrators to decide which entropy sources are of importance to them, for which they have an entropy assessment and which they think uh, are good. And uh, all others are either disabled or are credited with an entropy rate that is uh, providing only very limited amount of entropy. When data is obtained from these entropy sources, it is fed into the DRNG. And then when the DRNG has to produce random numbers, the output, the generate operation, is then wired up to the different APIs uh, that actually feed these uh, random numbers to the respective caller. Speaking of those output APIs, let's have a look at them. So we have two types of APIs. First, we have our blocking APIs. These APIs only deliver data after the DRNG is fully initialized and fully seeded. Of course, the question is now, what does that mean, fully initialized and fully seeded? One of our subsequent slides will 
exactly discuss this topic. And so therefore, please bear with me and let's just defer it. So which blocking APIs do we have? We have uh, dev random and we have the get random system call when it has been invoked without any specific flags. And finally, the get random bytes full in kernel API, uh, which is called after being triggered by the add random ready callback that would fire only when the DRNG is fully initialized and fully seen. All other APIs that we have in the LRNG deliver data without blocking until the DRNG is fully initialized. So therefore they do not provide any guarantee whether um, it is su sufficiently initialized or seeded. After looking at the output side of the DRNG, now let's look at the input side of the DRNG. And that actually is the seeding part. So again, as mentioned with the design, we do have this temporary seed buffer, which is a concatenation of all output from all entropy sources. During, C, uh, during boot of the system, we actually apply the following concepts. The DRNG is seeded after all entropy sources have collectively available 32 bits of entropy, then second, uh, at the second time when 128 bits of entropy are available, and finally when 256 bits of entropy are available. Now the question is why these three steps? Well, 32 bits uh, is uh, reached very fast uh, during kernel boot, way before user space actually takes hold. And we seed the DRNG with at least some entropy to make sure uh, we do not uh, provide the same random numbers that uh, have been produced during the last boot, for example. The next step, 128, is also commonly achieved before user space boots. And it is already the threshold uh, where it provides a meaningful cryptographic security strength. Yet the full cryptographic security strength of 256 bits is then reached in the third step. And that third step is commonly uh, reached uh, either around the time user space boots or, the, or very shortly thereafter, say during the time when the root partition is mounted. At runtime, of course, the DRNG also needs to be reseeded. And the reseeds uh, are performed after either uh, performing or uh, servicing two to the power of 20 generate requests or after the elapse of 10 minutes, whatever comes first. In addition, user space can force the DRNG to reseed. Finally, a reseed is also triggered when a new DRNG implementation is loaded. Remember at the beginning I mentioned that it is possible that the cryptographic primitives can be updated and they can even be updated at runtime. So that means when it has been changed, the DRNG uh, needs to be reseeded naturally. But there's a caveat. The DRNG is only reseeded after or when the entropy sources collectively uh, provide or have at least 128 bits available. If you boot the LRNG with a different mode, this SP890C mode, then it is required that the entropy sources even provide 256 bits of entropy. When the seeding commences, the entropy sources are each requested to provide 256 bits of entropy. Yet, the entropy sources are, may deliver less depending on whatever they have available. And the interesting aspect is that when the LRNG identifies that reseeding is due, it only actually sets a flag. And the reseeding uh, then is performed at the time the DRNG is requested to produce random bits. That means the DRNG checks this flag. And if that flag indicates that reseeding is due, then it will uh, go out to the entropy sources and fetch data. So with that, it might be possible <coughs> that uh, when the DRNG uh, wants to seed from the entropy sources, these entropy sources, in fact, actually do not provide sufficient entropy. Like it does not provide 
and they do not provide 128 or 256 bits. That's actually quite harmless uh, considering how often we do reseed if you look at the initial um, statements. However, it becomes harmful if uh, it is repetitive that uh, reseedings are not completed. And there is a precaution in the DRNG where when the DRNG has not been reseeded with a full uh, strength uh, for more than two to the power of 30 generate requests, then the DRNG goes back into the non-seeded state. What does that mean? If you look, if you consider the previous slide, there uh, the non-seeded stage means that the blocking APIs will again block. That means it's possible that the def random or get random will block eventually. The pictures that you see here on uh, this slide um, show the regular seeding behavior. That means the upper picture is the regular seeding behavior, where you see the different um, where you see the different entropy sources, uh, the interrupt, CPU-based jitter RNG, and the uh, auxiliary entropy pool. It also shows you uh, the amount of data that's being collected uh, by the respective uh, entropy source and the amount of entropy awarded to this data. On the other hand, the picture at the bottom uh, shows a different seeding strategy, and we will see uh, shortly that uh, what these different seeding strategy actually entail. Another aspect that is of importance is that uh, the LRNG is capable of managing uh, different DRNG instances per NUMA node, if NUMA node is being compiled. Also, the hash context used for conditioning, we'll see in a, in a second what conditioning means, will also be a handled NUMA node locally. Every DRNG seeds itself from the actual temporary seed buffer, but in order uh, since, or since uh, during boot time insufficient entropy may be available, the, uh, the DRNG instances are being initialized in a sequential order. So first the DRNG for NUMA node zero is initialized then for NUMA node one and so on. Uh, uh, so uh, how entropy is available essentially. And if uh, a request for random number comes in, the LRNG tries to service it uh, through the NUMA node local DRNG instance, but if that is not yet fully seeded, it reverts back to using the DRNG for NUMA node zero. And to prevent a reseed storm, uh, considering that all the DRNGs are managed independently of each other, the at least timer-based reseed thresholds uh, are different for each DRNG. The DRNG for NUMA node zero has still the 10 minutes uh, that I mentioned before. Then we have NUMA node one, which has 700 seconds. NUMA node two has 800 seconds and so on. Yet this entire code is only present and compiled if the NUMA support is compiled for the time. I mentioned that we only use cryptographic primitives for data processing. Now let's have a look what that really means. Actually, we first have to consider what processing steps do we have that we need to consider. We first, of course, have the DRNG. The DRNG uh, is one cryptographic uh, primitive that's been used. The second one is actually the conditioning hash. Uh, we will see uh, when we uh, discuss the entropy sources, what conditioning really means uh, and how data is being processed there. But at this point, let's just say that the conditioning hash is either a SHA-256 or uh, we will see a SHA-512. The built-in uh, uh, cryptographic primitives uh, is uh, a ChaCha-20 DRNG. You see here in that picture, uh, the concept of the ChaCha-20 DRNG. Essentially, um, it is the key stream that has been provided by the uh, ChaCha-20 operation that serves as the random number uh, that is being returned to the caller. In addition, uh, the uh, DRNG implementation uh, implements an enhanced backward secrecy, which means that the internal state of the ChaCha20 uh, DRNG implementation is being updated every time uh, a 
random number request is being serviced. For the conditioning hash, uh, the built-in implementation rests on SHA-256. This implementation has been taken from uh, the slash light directory and you see uh, it, the built-in implementations do not rest on the kernel crypt API. So it means uh, that it is possible for the LNG to be compiled without uh, the kernel crypt API support. But if it is available, the kernel crypto API, then we also can draw on its uh, primitives. And there we have uh, an SP890 ADRBG, which uses accelerated AES or SHA primitives. And we can even use accelerated uh, SHA primitives. In our case, we use a SHA512 for the condition. Other implementations might be used, for example, even uh, hardware-based DRNGs like CP CPEG-F, uh, which might be wired up uh, through the kernel crypto API. Considering that the LRNG provides a well-defined API uh, to other, uh, to, to the kernel, it allows the developers to provide other implementations of these cryptographic primitives, which might then be used uh, and uh, loaded at uh, boot or runtime and uh, then used by the LRNG instead of uh, the primitives I mentioned here. However, for all primitives uh, that I outlined here and which are provided by the LRNG, a complete test uh, is available, verifying that these cryptographic primitives indeed comply with this specification. The test harness uh, is based on NIST's ACVP framework and the GitHub repository here provides you with the access to uh, testing these primitives. In addition, the ChaCha20 based DRNG is externalized into user space, which allow researchers uh, to analyze the behavior of the DRNG in user space and uh, can easily compare it to the implementation in kernel end because both of them are identical. But full disclosure, of course, there is more data processing that we have to consider. And that is the concatenation that I already mentioned, basically when we concatenate the temporary seed buffer uh, or the, the entropy sources that feed the temporary seed buffer. And we have another one, and that is the truncation of the conditioning message digest to the heuristic entropy value that this data actually is supposed to contain. Yet, all of those primitives that I mentioned are considerably fully understood with respect to its behavior uh, towards entropy. And I think all of those primitives are completely uncontended when it comes to its behavior with respect to entropy and the guarantee that entropy is being maintained. With that, uh, we actually concluded the discussion of the deterministic side of the LRNG. And now let's have a look at the non-deterministic part, which means the entropy sources. So we do have two types of entropy sources, external versus internal. Let's first clarify what external versus internal really means here. With external, the LRNG uh, considers entropy sources for which the LRNG has no control and no concept about. All data that's been provided by these external entropy sources are being, uh, is being taken at face value. The entropy rate that these entropy sources uh, claim to provide are taken at face value. That said, what type of external entropy sources we have? Actually, we do have two types. We have first the fast, which means this entropy source can provide data at the time the LRNG requests it. So we have two implementations here. We have the jitter-based RNG and we have a, a CPU uh, instruction-based uh, entropy source, for example, our Intel RDC and so on. In addition, these slow entropy sources, external entropy sources, well, they are not slow in the fact that they provide a, a slow rate, but rather they provide data uncontrolled uh, by the LRNG. So the LRNG has to expect data at any time and they, uh, the LRNG cannot go out to the entropy sources to fetch data from it straight away. 
So data is just trickling. All data that is trickling in has to be somehow stored and managed. And that is managed and stored in this auxiliary entry report that you see uh, here on the lower right part of that picture. The concept of the auxiliary tools is actually quite straightforward. It is a hash context. And every time data is being received, this data is being inserted into that uh, auxiliary pool by performing a hash update uh, operation. When data is being uh, required from that auxiliary pool, well, the message digest is being created, followed by an immediate reinitialization of that uh, hash context and the insertion of the temporary receipt buffer into the hash, uh, into that state. That reinsertion of the temporary receipt buffer into that state is only there to ensure backtracking resistance, but that temporary receipt buffer is not considered to contain any entropy anymore because it is used to seed the DRNG and transport its entropy over there. Now let's look at the internal entropy source. When external entropy source means uh, the LNG has no concept of, of its structure, the internal of course means the LNG has full control over that entropy source. It knows all its uh, concepts and uh, knows the entropy state. And we have one internal entropy source, which is based on interrupt timing. All interrupts that are being received by the LNG are treated as one, ent uh, one entropy source. The data collection, uh, that's uh, being implemented by the LRNG is executed in interrupt context. In addition, eventually, data need also needs to be compressed with the conditioning hash. And that is partially in, uh, implemented in interrupt context and partially in uh, process context. And as I mentioned, this compression is a hash update operation because uh, the con concept of this entropy pool is identical to the auxiliary pool where uh, the entropy pool is just the hash state, the hash context state. Now you may uh, scratch your head and say, wait a minute, how can it be that a hash update operation, which is very costly, uh, which executes an interrupt context, can still lead to a high performance interrupt handler? Well, you see here with the uh, graph in the up part, actually the measurements that I have conducted. That graph shows uh, the mean duration in CPU cycles to service one interrupt within the LRNG. That depends on the collection size. Please bear with me, the collection size is explained in the next slide, so therefore just take it. The default collection size is 1024, so that means if I, uh, if I look at the graph for AVX SHA 512 uh, conditioning hash, it takes on average a little bit more than 40 cycles to service. If you compare that with the existing web random implementation, uh, the, uh, which is marked with a gray line, uh, the uh, existing web random implementation uh, requires uh, close to 100 cycles on average to service one request. And that means you see it already that the uh, uh, interrupt handler of the LRNG is almost twice as uh, fast uh, or more than twice as fast as the existing implementation. And that can even be uh, faster uh, if a certain kernel configuration option is being disabled, the continuous compression operation, if that is disabled, which means that the hash update operation even is then moved into process context to have an even higher uh, or, or faster interrupt handler. Now let's look at the uh, processing side. How can it be achieved, uh, this, this performance? And I have two pictures here with me. Uh, and let's have a look at the uh, topmost picture. And there, let's look at the top right, uh, top left part. Eventually, the kernel receives an interrupt and pings the LRNG that such interrupt has been received. The LRNG now obtains uh, its timestamp. Um, in our case, it's just a cycle counter for, from RDTSC, for example, on Intel. It divides uh, this value by the greatest common divisor and takes only the eight least significant bits of that data. 
it applies some entropy estimate on it and it performs some health tests on it. And then it concatenates it into uh, the per CPU collection pool. That collection pool again is per CPU, which means uh, it can be accessed without any lock. So therefore already we have a lockless handling here. Additional uh, data uh, that is not believed to have any entropy can also be added into the co uh, collection pool uh, that may be received by the CPU while uh, the interrupt is being serviced. When the interrupt, uh, when the uh, collection pool is completely filled, then and only then the hash update operation is performed to insert the collection pool state into the actual entropy pool. And again, that entropy pool is also CPU local. That means also this hash update operation would be uh, serviced without taking a log. If the continuous compression is disabled, then also the insertion of the collection pool into the uh, entropy pool, uh, into that hash state, will not be performed while uh, during an interrupt service, but actually at process context. When now the temporary receipt buffer shall be filled with uh, data from the, inter uh, from the interrupt uh, entropy source, then it calculates or requests the generation of the message digest from each entropy pool. All of those message digests are being fed into another hash uh, to have a combined uh, data uh, set for uh, all entropy pools, for all uh, CPU local entropy pools. This is followed immediately by a reinitialization of the per CPU entropy pool so uh, in order to service the next insertion of the collection pool. When we look at the internal entropy source, uh, we also need to now provide a means of analyzing it because here, the LRNG is responsible for that entropy source and it shall provide all means to researchers and testers and validators and reviewers and peer developers to analyze whether the entropy data uh, is actually uh, providing sufficient entropy or whether it's good enough for uh, all use cases. The testing code that's been provided actually is enabled at compile time. That means if you disable it, which should be uh, the case for production uh, kernels, <coughs> no trace of these tests and test codes uh, is in the kernel at all. Also, no interfaces are being exported. Yet when you compile it, then you can access these test interfaces via debug FS files. These debug FS files actually provide ASCII data output but uh, I provide a small tool that formats this data a little bit nicer so that you can uh, immediately post-process it with the, your favorite analyze tool. What type of interfaces uh, actually do we provide? We have um, test interfaces uh, to obtain the totally raw and unprocessed entropy timestamps that are being co uh, collected for each interrupt. We can also collect other event values, which may or may not uh, be uh, collected uh, by the LRNG. In addition, we have a test interface to analyze the performance of the LRNG's interrupt handler. Finally, we also have a test interface for the hashing implementation of the built-in SHA-256. Uh, hashing uh, conditioner. This allows uh, testers and uh, people who want to analyze it uh, to, uh, whether the SHA-256 implementation truly follows uh, the specification of SHA-256. With these provided test interfaces, actually, we do now have a full SP-890B uh, compliant test cycle available that uh, could lead to a full uh, 90B uh, entropy assessment. And in fact, uh, as part of the 
code base, uh, I provide a full-fledged documentation with uh, a full entropy assessment on the interrupt entropy source. All tools that were needed or that are needed to perform this entropy assessment are provided as part of the uh, code distribution. So uh, it allows every developer and researcher to perform this, to re-perform this analysis on uh, the system of your choice. The table that you see here in that slide actually gives you a glimpse on the testing that I have uh, performed on different CPU types. And all of those CPU types provide sufficient entropy. Another aspect that is, should not be forgotten is that health tests shall be applied. Actually, we do have two types of health tests, which can be enabled at compile time. So if you disable it, naturally the code is not there. You do not uh, incur any performance penalties that uh, these health tests apply or provide. The first type of health test is actually a power-up self-test, which verifies the cryptographic mechanisms, whether they are okay or not. And it also validates the timestamp management. It means the collection pool is tested whether it truly performs a proper uh, concatenation of timestamps and time data. We also have an adaptive proportion and a repetitive count test uh, for the entropy data. That means these tests shall, shall verify that the entropy data actually uh, is, uh, whether it, it is temporarily degraded. Uh, in addition, um, the, we have a, a timestamp pattern detector, which rests on the fact that the first, second, and third uh, derivative of time is calculated, which must always be not equal to zero. With the presence of an adaptive proportion test, um, the blocking interfaces will block until uh, this test actually completed its power-up cycle. The good thing is uh, the adaptive proportion test and the repetitive count tests are only enabled uh, with a certain uh, boot time flag because uh, it might not be of relevance uh, for, for, for some users. And with that, with these health tests, we actually achieve an SP890B compliant uh, entropy source. Let's have a look at now the seeding strategies. Uh, because the seeding strategies uh, guarantee that uh, we do have a fully seeded DRNG uh, as early as possible. Let's recap. Uh, we already mentioned that we have these three steps uh, where the DRNG is initially seeded with 32 bits, with 128 bits, and 256 bits of entropy, which marks an initial seed, the minimal seed, and the fully seeded DRNG. The blocking interfaces are being released when the DRNG is fully seeded. This is the default uh, uh, operation, which is applied when there is no other specific uh, seeding strategy uh, configured and compiled. Yet what other options do we have? And that is actually a, a seeding strategy based on uh, entropy source oversampling. The initial and minimal seeding steps still apply. Uh, however, the fully seeded step is changed. This oversampling seeding strategy is only available if compiled uh, or if selected at compile time. Otherwise, it is not available. Uh, in addition, uh, a certain com uh, kernel command line flag must be set and the conditioning hash must be greater or equal than uh, 384 bits. What does it mean? The entropy sources are requested to provide more entropy than the conditioner hash actually can transport. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that the DRNG is being seeded with more entropy than the uh, security strength of the DRNG. That seeding applies only during the initialization, that means the initial seeding. Uh, any subsequent seeding then reverts back to require only a seeding strength uh, of the st uh, security strength of the DRNG. The LRNG ensures that every entropy source alone is capable, at least capable, of providing this uh, 
oversampling just by itself, which means that uh, if a vendor uh, wants only one entropy source to uh, provide all its entropy, the LRNG uh, allows you to do that. Finally, this oversampling uh, strategy is actually compliant with SP 890 c at least the current draft, uh, and it complies there with the construction method of an RBG2 non-physical and an RBG2 physical if certain configurations are being applied to the LRG. Now, before I release uh, the LRNG patch set, actually I provide an extensive testing to make sure it operates as it's supposed to be. First, uh, I have a, an automated regression test suite available, which covers all the different options of the LRNG. You know, you've heard that we have many compile time and, and runtime options, and uh, they are all being tested to really truly work as intended. In addition, there's a locking torture test. Uh, why is that? Well, I mean, I said that the cryptographic primitives can be changed and updated at runtime. But at the same time, of course, the LRNG may be requested just to provide random numbers. And this locking torture test basically uh, causes a full load of the LRNG and uh, performs a loading and unloading uh, operation of the DRNGs uh, in a repetitive form and fashion. Also, I applied uh, certain kernel test frameworks that I listed here, like KZAN, UBSAN, LOCKED, the memory leak detector, SPARS. Another test is actually just a compile time test, uh, and that is uh, to see that the LRNG can be compiled without the kernel crypto API. So, and it is successfully able to do so. Also, I provide uh, performance tests. You see the table here that gives you an idea of these performance. Uh, performances. I have a syscall validation testing and there is finally a test of the LRNG behavior in atomic contexts. This now leads me to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, I would like to point out where the actual code is residing. Here you have the GitHub repository where that code is located along uh, with all test tools that I mentioned and the actual documentation. Remember, there is a full-fledged documentation uh, and entropy assessment, at least of the internal entropy source. The testing that I mentioned uh, has been conducted not only on an Intel x86 or an AMD system, but also on ARMs, on different ARM systems, 64 and 32 bits, <laughs> on small-scale MIPS uh, processors on a power LE and BE system, as well as an IBM C mainframe or a RISC-V system. You see, we ca or I covered uh, embedded systems as well as big irons. Also at the uh, GitHub repository, you will find backporting patches to long-term support kernels that I listed here, and in addition, also other kernels. So with that, um, I would like to uh, close my talk and hope that I provided at least a, a good uh, addition to, uh, to discuss uh, the uh, future of that random uh, and uh, provide a complete production ready implementation of uh, a def random device where which uses contemporary cryptography and uh, a con contemporary uh, approach without too many processing steps. With that, thank you very much for listening. And I would like then uh, to ask if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. With that, thank you very much and bye-bye.